Well, good morning, friends. Uh, I'm so glad that you can uh, join us today uh, in this uh, worship video that we're presenting from Kennewick First United Methodist Church. Uh, obviously, uh, this morning's video is a little different than we're used to. Uh, everything seems to be new every week as we uh, go through this uh, COVID virus uh, pandemic together. But this morning, we'll be uh, splicing together some of the uh, parts of worship that each of our worship team has done in their individual location. And so this is going to be more of a production video than maybe we've seen in the past. It seemed appropriate that since I was filming my part of worship from home that I do it in the sunshine here in my backyard since so many of us have been cooped up for a while. It just seemed appropriate to be out here rather than in the, the sanctuary of our church to be here in the Cathedral of Nature. And so it was a beautiful day, so uh, I'm filming this outside uh, in my backyard. So I'm so glad that you can be uh, here and participate. I hope that this worship service is not just a, a static thing that you watch on television, but that you can participate along with us. Um, having said that, if you haven't already, if you go over to our church's webpage at www.kinwickfirst.com, and if you click on the news button there, you can download an order of worship and you can download lyrics to the songs that we're uh, going to be uh, singing here during this video and so that you can participate alongside us. Um, if you haven't done that already, feel free to hit the pause button for a minute and run over uh, to our webpage and you can download those things and use those to participate in our worship service uh, if, if you'd like to do that. Uh, the other thing that uh, I am just uh, kind of excited about is that because each of us is filming this from our own location and then splicing it together um, as a, a worship service, we get an opportunity to do some things that maybe we wouldn't do before. We're going to have uh, uh, some volunteers from our youth group and from our Sunday school uh, be uh, our liturgists and read scripture for us today. Uh, Rob Stafford has uh, graciously volunteered to record an offertory for us today. And so we're going to be able to splice those in and uh, and put together uh, a, a whole service that incorporates uh, all those people giving uh, their time and their talents for us to uh, to lead us in a time of worship. So having said that, let's embark on this worship service together. I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Amberly and her family and Margo as they uh, have recorded a song for us. But this first song, uh, I hope it is just an opportunity for you to, to center yourself, to let the, the hustle and the bustle and all the things that are going on in the world just melt away for a minute and to concentrate on who we are and why we're here and who it is that we're worshiping. So let me uh, turn it over for our first song. Hey everyone, good morning. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, kind of an exciting way to do church, but you know, <laughs> desperate times call for desperate measures or something like that. Um, we wanna say a big thank you to Margo who recorded the music at her house and sent it to us. And now we're going to record it here at our house and send it to Mark and he's going to put it all together. So um, lots, of, lots of pieces involved this week. Um, but we hope that you'll sing along with us and we can still have a worship service together. If you want to print off the words for the songs that we're going to sing this morning, they are available at kennewickfirst.com on the news page. And there's a sheet that has the lyrics for all our songs. So this first song that we're going to sing this morning um, talks about the hand of God in our lives throughout the ages. Um, throughout the ages of history, God has had his hand on the lives of the people who love him. And that is no less true today than it was in Abraham's time or in Paul's time. So we can take comfort in the fact that his promises are still true for us today. So we hope you'll sing along. Prophets 
So as I said, I hope that this uh, worship service is uh, not just a static thing that you're watching, but something that we can participate in. You know, one of the things that's important about being a, a church is not only that we celebrate and worship together, but that we also care for one another and that we take care of one another. And so uh, I want to give you an opportunity, uh, as we would in any worship service, for you to, to take a moment to just greet somebody. Uh, I'm going to ask you just right now as you're watching this video, if you have your phone with you, if you'd send a text to somebody, uh, wish them good morning. Let them know that you're you're thinking about them this morning. Uh, if you're watching this on a Tuesday night, I want you to just go ahead and send a text or an email to somebody and let them know that that you care about them and that you're you're thinking about them and just a way to, to reach out and um, and offer a hand of love and friendship uh, as an act of worship with us this morning. So I'm going to give you a, a couple of seconds to do that. Uh, and uh, Feel free to reach out to anybody and uh, just offer them a greeting uh, this morning and let them know that you're, you're thinking about them and that you're praying for them. You know, one of the things that, that we worry about uh, during this time, especially at the church, is, uh, of course, our finances. Uh, I know that for many of us, we've made a commitment to, um, to give uh, financially to help uh, our church continue to do the things that God's called us to do, to be involved in the ministry uh, with people in the, in the city of Kennewick, to, to help us provide uh, worship and keep our facilities up so that there's a place where people can have weddings and that they can do uh, the funerals and that they can grieve and where classes take place and where we hear the, the good news of this gospel. All those things, you know, require funds. And I was talking to, to Sharon, our uh, bookkeeper, and I asked her, you know, how much of our, our income for the church comes in on Sunday morning? And she said about 70 percent of our income comes in on Sunday morning and about 30 percent of it comes in through mail or other uh, other means. And uh, so, you know, since we aren't meeting in person on Sunday mornings, uh, you know, the, uh, the um, possibility that 70% of our income wouldn't be coming in means that in the future we won't be able to do some of the things that we feel like God's calling us to do. Uh, I've mentioned in the past that there's ways for us, for those of us that, that put a, a check in the offering plate or for those of us that are fulfilling a, a commitment to financially support the ministries that God's called us to here at Kinwick First, that there's ways to do that. Some of us do online banking where, like myself, I, my bank sends a, a check every month for my tithe and it's just automatically uh, mailed from my, uh, from my bank account. Some of us uh, give electronically, and in fact, this morning, if you want to, you can go over to our church webpage again, and at the top of the webpage, there's uh, a button that says Give. Uh, that'll take you to our uh, our PushPay account, and there you can make uh, your donation there rather than dropping an envelope in an offering plate as it comes by. Uh, 
We also have an option today uh, in, in just a moment. The, the number will come up that you can uh, use your phone and that you can give by text. And there'll be some instructions here in just a moment about how you can do that as well. But um, I, I want to just encourage us all to be faithful to the commitments that we made to help support our church financially, especially in times like this where we can't meet in, uh, in, in person and face to face. And so I hope that you'll continue to be generous. I hope that all of us will continue to, to be part of what God is calling us to do at Kennewick First and that we can be uh, generous with our financial gifts even in times of trouble. Thanks so much, friends. I'm going to turn it over and let um, Rob uh, uh, give us uh, his offertory today. And uh, I'm just so thankful that Rob was able to, uh, to videotape this for us. Friends, I'm going to offer a, a pastoral prayer in the midst of this worship service. So let me invite you to take just a, a moment where you are to, uh, to center yourself, and let me invite you to join me in a time of prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, in the midst of all the things that are going on in the world, in the midst of the fears that we feel, Lord, in the midst of the worry that seems to grip so many of us, Lord, we pray for your guidance. Lord, we pray for your peace. And Lord, we pray that we would remind, be reminded that you are a God who loves us, the God who cares for us, and the God who gives wonderful gifts. And Lord, I pray that we would all be reminded to give you thanks for those gifts that you have given to us. But Lord, we also pray for your guidance, for your peace, for your healing hand. 
Lord, in the midst of disease and illness, Lord, for friends and family that are dealing with a pandemic, Lord, for a nation that is gripped by fear. Lord, we pray that truly we would feel your spirit, that your kingdom would come just as it is in heaven. Lord, we invite you to be the Prince of Peace for us and that we would be instruments in your hand that share that peace with the rest of our world. Lord, we lift our world's leaders to you. Lord, we pray that you would impart to them your wisdom. And Lord, we pray that in this time of need that you would be the God who leads us to a place of safety and to wholeness. Lord, we lift all of these things to you as we pray that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into a time of temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as I mentioned before, one of the nice things about being able to do worship like this is that we're able to have volunteers come in and participate right from where they are. And so this morning we've got a couple of volunteers who are going to be reading our scripture for us from uh, our youth group and from our Sunday school. So let me turn it over to them as they read uh, our passages of scripture from uh, the Gospel of Luke this morning. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered the Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to ha have you do this because he loves our nation and he was built and had built our synagogue. So Jesus went to them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for i do not deserve to have you come under my roof that is why i did not even consider myself worthy to come to you but say the word and my serv servant will be healed for myself i am a man of authority with soldiers under me i tell this one to Go and he goes, and servant, and that one comes, and he comes, and I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to, to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and he and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, 
Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts to both. Now which of them will he love him more? Simon replied. I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So thanks so much, everybody, for uh, being able to tune in uh, to this worship service here um, on YouTube. Uh, I'm so glad that we can continue to worship together. So, you know, over the, the last few weeks uh, during Lent, we've been trying to follow uh, a book by Scott, Scott McKnight called The Jesus Creed. And of course, as things have changed, we've taken some uh, changes in the course and some of the things that we've talked about during Lent have had to change, obviously, because of just situations in the world. But I'm going to try to get us back a little bit on track to the things that Scott talks about in his book, The Jesus Creed. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about how Scott's premise of his book is that uh, at the core of what Jesus talks to us about, at the core of the gospel of Jesus, is this creed that Jesus has. And he points us to a story in which uh, 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 an expert of the law comes to Jesus and tries to trick him or challenge him and says, so Jesus, tell us what is the most important uh, rule to follow? What is the most important of all the laws that Moses gave us? And Jesus, without batting an eyelash, uh, responds by quoting one of the, the most famous prayers of the Jewish tradition, a prayer that they would quote every morning called the Shema, in which it says, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your strength. And Jesus says, that's the most important. But before they can even break into to the things that he's saying, he continues and he says, and the second is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. There are no commandments greater than these. And at the heart of that uh, question and at the heart of the answer to that question is Jesus giving us this creed, as Scott says, that gives us an image of what the gospel is all about, that we are to love God with all that we are and that we are to love others, that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And he says that's what's at the core, at the heart of the gospel of Jesus. And so we've been looking at, at some things about, about how we love God and how in Scripture it gives us an example of, of loving God is not just merely following the Torah or following Scripture, but that Jesus and scripture says that we love God by following him, by following Jesus. You know, last week we talked about this phrase that Jesus used so often to talk about a society that operated with this understanding of loving God and loving others. And Jesus called that the kingdom of God. It's a phrase that he uses over and over. And we talked about how one of the foundations of this kingdom of God that Jesus talks about is a foundational idea of justice. And for Jesus, the framework or, or the foundation of justice itself was an understanding of loving God and loving others. We talked about how in a world that, that works together in which we reflect those principles, that, that we work together in a large scale to, to um, put an end to systems that, that marginalize people or, or push people to the margins, uh, put an end to systems that degrade people or somehow say they are not of worth. And Jesus gives us these examples that a society that is based on loving God and loving others is a society that is just. And so he gives us that image. And one of those foundations of the kingdom of God is justice. But this morning I want to talk to us a little bit about the other foundation that Jesus talks about for this kingdom of God. It's compassion. So if justice is this idea of working on a grand scale to, to create a world that reflects loving God and loving others, Jesus also tells us that the other foundation for the kingdom of God is compassion. 
this morning in our scripture passages in Luke chapter 7, there's actually three stories about three different women. The first story that we heard read for us this morning is a story that sounds like it's about a centurion or a Roman official, but as the story unfolds, it's really about a slave woman that is part of his household that his family loves, who has become sick. And this uh, centurion or this Roman soldier sins for Jesus, and this uh, Roman official has somehow gained the trust and the um, honor of the Jewish people that he's uh, put in charge over. And so they invite uh, Jesus to come to their house in this time of need, and Jesus says that he'll go. And so Jesus is on his way to the house, and the, the Roman authority comes and says, no, you don't understand. You can't come into my house. It's, it's not a good thing for you. You don't really understand who I am, and this isn't about me. It's about who I believe you are. And in the midst of that conversation, Jesus understands the faith and understands that this Roman soldier understands Jesus differently than anybody else does. And he says, I haven't seen this kind of faith anywhere in Israel. And it says at that point, this slave woman who is part of this household that his household loves is healed. And then in the next uh, couple of chapters in, or next couple of verses, in verses 11 through 17, we didn't hear those read for us, but it says that as Jesus is leaving or is entering the city, he comes to the gates of the city and there's a funeral procession that is uh, walking out. And at the head of the procession is a, a woman and it says that she's a widow who is grieving the loss of her son. Now that is a loaded phrase. Uh, in first century Palestine, as we've talked about before, for women in first century Palestine, uh, life was difficult. I mean, you were at best, if you were a woman, a second class citizen. And oftentimes you were put in places where you were not able to survive unless you had the help of a man. You weren't able to own property or run a business or earn a living. And so in that very simple phrase that says it was a widow who was grieving the loss of her son, we have this image of a woman who has already had one strike in which her husband has passed away. Another strike in which her son, the next man who could have maybe taken care of her and helped her survive, has now passed. And as she is grieving and as she's leading this procession to go and bury her son, you can only imagine the feelings and the turmoil and the grief that she has. Not only the loss of her son after having lost her husband, but now the worry and the fear of how is she going to survive. And then something remarkable happens. The author of Luke says that Jesus walks over and he stops the procession and he walks up to the casket and he speaks to the young man who's being taken off to be buried and he says, get up. And the young man rises out of the casket and as an act of compassion, Jesus gives this son back to his mother, gives them hope and as an act of compassion changes their story. And then finally, in the last story that we heard read for us from Luke chapter 7, we hear a story about a Pharisee named Simon who invites Jesus to a dinner party, for lack of a better word. And as, G and as Jesus attends that party, it seems very obvious that Simon has only invited Jesus there as a way to bolster his own clout as a way of being able to say, you know, that guy that everyone's talking about, that Jesus, you know where he's going to be next week? He's going to be in my house. And he has this party as a way to, to brag and to bolster his own uh, worth with the community that he's a part of. And as Jesus comes to that party, it's obvious that he tries to put Jesus in a place where he knows exactly who's in charge. And Simon thinks that it's him. So he doesn't offer him even the customary hospitality or greeting, doesn't give him an opportunity to even wash his feet as he comes into this house. And then as the story goes, it says that a woman makes her way into Simon's house. Uh, this woman is, how do we put this kindly, a woman with a questionable history. And she walks into Simon's house and she kneels before Jesus' feet and she begins to wash Jesus' feet with her hair and with her tears. She begins to kiss his feet and spends this time, in a sense, worshiping Jesus providing this act of hospitality and compassion with a love that is expressed that nobody at this party has expressed to Jesus since he's been there. 
And Simon the Pharisee sees this all unfold and he makes the comment, he says, if Jesus were really a prophet, surely he would know who this woman is and wouldn't allow her to be doing such a thing in front of all of these religious leaders, which for me begs the question, how does Simon know who this woman is? We don't get that story in scripture, but um, I have some ideas about that. But I love Jesus' response because Jesus then responds, first of all, he says, Simon, I don't have anything to say to you. In a sense, he's saying, Simon, just shut up. But then he gives Simon this little case study in which he says, so who should be more grateful? If two people have a debt that needs to be forgiven and one of the debts is large and one of them is small and they're both forgiven, which of those two men should be more grateful? And Simon says, well, of course, the one who has the greater debt. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. And then he goes on to get specific with Simon. He says, so you know, you didn't even offer me the hospitality of, of kissing my cheek when I came into your house. And you didn't even offer me an opportunity to wash my feet. But this woman has come in and she's washing my feet with her hair and she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since she's been here. Very quickly, he understands what is going on. And this woman who has been pushed to the outside, this woman who has a story that we don't get to hear, but who has had to survive and has been treated harshly and has been told she is not of value because of it, all of a sudden is given a seat at the most influential dinner party in town. I mean, for Jesus, these are acts of compassion. These are, are acts that revolve around helping and giving to the individual. They're not stories about Jesus saying we should change society. He has lots of those stories in the Sermon on the Mount and in his inaugural sermon in, in Nazareth in which he tells us that we should be working for a world that is just and right. But in these stories, he gives us an image of the kingdom of God, of what it is like to love others by doing something for an individual, for someone who has a name, for someone who has a story. And in these stories of these three women, he gives us this image of compassion. If justice is about changing society and making things right, the other foundation of this kingdom of God that Jesus describes for us is compassion, in which we care for an individual, in which we understand the needs and the story of what is happening with someone, and we help because we love God and because we love others. So in these three stories, Jesus gives us an image of what the kingdom of God is like. He gives us an image of the kingdom of God that revolves around justice. And he gives us an image of a kingdom of God that revolves around compassion for an individual in the midst of their story. In these stories, we find Jesus breaking into the, the long history and the story of each of these three women and offering hope offering them love and offering them God's grace. I pray that for us as a congregation, we are able to be able to share that kind of love with the world around us, especially in the weeks ahead. I know for many of us, we are trying to imagine what the other side of this virus is going to look like. We're trying to understand what the new normal is going to look like in a series of months after we emerge from this pandemic. And as I see it, there's going to be a lot of people who need help. There are going to be people who need compassion. There are going to be people who need us to break into their stories with God's love and God's grace. And I pray that as a community of faith, Kennewick First United Methodist Church would be a church that works for the kingdom of God. That we would truly believe that all of us are beloved children of God and that we can all experience God's spirit and be part of a spirit-filled community. And that we can all work for a world that reflects the justice and the reign and the grace of God. And so I hope today we've heard in these stories what the kingdom of God is really like. And that we can understand that the kingdom of God revolves around this Jesus creed. That we love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul and all of our strength and that we love our neighbor as ourself because there are no commandments greater than these. Amen. Amen. As we close out our service today, let's remember that our hope ultimately is in the Lord. Let's sing. <laughs>
So friends, let me offer uh, a benediction for us as we finish this time of worship together. Go from here celebrating that we serve a God who loves us. Go from here understanding that in this kingdom of God, we have an opportunity to love God with all that we are and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Go from here in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs> Watching for you and for me.